So I'm going to take it over to another level. Uh, Dr. Waterhouse spent some time talking to you about SO2 chemistry. And I'm going to focus on phenolics because uh, uh, we're definitely very much interested in that. Give you a brief outline of, uh, of what I'm going to talk to you about. I'll start with a discussion of color stability and astringency modification. And when we're talking about oxygen and red wine production, it's very much trying to understand how can we stabilize red wine color and then how do we influence the development of astringency, the mouthfeel of the wine. I'll talk about some of the work that's been done in the past uh, in terms of understanding those different structures that are formed uh, when a red wine system is exposed to oxygen. And then I'll uh, talk about uh, structures, the maturation, post-bottling, oxygen exposure, and how that can be used to manage the composition of red wine with respect to color stability and astringency. And then I'll finish up with a little bit of a discussion on practical implications. So let's start with uh, the characters. Uh, anthocyanins are extremely important in red wine, obviously. They're uh, responsible for the color. Um, just a couple of things to point out. Uh, there are major uh, different equilibrium forms of the anthocyanins that are present in red wine. Um, they're not stable. And it's very much, uh, is, uh, to take you back to your chemistry classes when you're in class, within two years, the anthocyanins that were produced by the grape and extracted during wine production are, for the most part, gone. And yet, the red color persists. And so as chemists, a lot of what we're really interested in is trying to understand what happens to that red color. What are the structures that are being formed, and how, how can we take advantage of that uh, in stabilizing it? We'd certainly like to op optimize the stability of extracted red wine color. And it's very clear with the abundance of research that has been uh, taking place that oxygen is a critical component of red wine color stability. Moving on to tannins. Uh, tannins are responsible for red wine astringency. And tannin development um, is clearly related to astringency quality and mouthfeel quality and overall red wine quality. And you all see that in your red wine production operations where you start with a young red wine and look at that uh, through the course of a year of aging in the barrel, there's no question that the structure, the mouthfeel of that wine changes over time, all right? And color incorporation into that tannin pool is considered to be related to astringency development. It's certainly considered to be a critical component of uh, color stability. A lot of the development that you see in astringency quality is very much, again, tied to oxygen management in, in, in production. So description of the issue that I'm going to talk about is really we'd like to be able to manage oxygen in red wine in order to optimize color stability and astringency quality. Pretty straightforward. OK. So um, this lecture is going to be kind of like an exercise. So we're going to warm up here. I'm going to show you a couple of structures to get you used to things. So is anyone taking spin class? So slow music kind of getting going. Uh, this is anthocyanins. Uh, these are the two major equilibrium forms that are found in a red wine system. Uh, one is red, and the other is not. Um, the red signifies the equilibrium form that you actually can observe. It is a minor component of the anthocyanins that are found in red wine. Okay, so the majority of the anthocyanin is that one on the lower right. Um, and if you are maintaining free SO2 levels in a new red wine, and you all observe this, when you add SO2 to a new red wine, it absolutely bleaches the system out. And that's one of the other major uh, structures that it can be found in red wine, and that's the bisulfite adduct of an anthocyanin. But these are the two big ones. Okay, let's click it up a notch. Um, Dr. Waterhouse told you there'd be a quiz. It's time for the quiz. Notebooks underneath the desk. Um, this is the same thing that Dr. Waterhouse showed, um, but just expressed a little bit differently. And Dr. Waterhouse talked about this uh, formation of quinones. If oxygen and SO2, if SO2 is not pr protecting the system, there's a portion of that oxygen is working on the wine. You're going to be producing some of these orthoquinones and the radicals, therefore. Um, and also, on the other side, you're going to be producing acetaldehyde, OK? And so these are very much reactive molecules. Nucleophiles, the SO2 that uh, Dr. Waterhouse added, it is a nucleophile, and it can inactivate these things. But in addition, there are a lot of other nucleophiles that are present in a wine system that will react with these reactive species, OK? So let's, uh, let's check a look at things. 
now we're getting into my realm. How are you guys doing? Playing a little Van Halen now. Uh, here's our anthocyanin. That's uh, a grape-derived anthocyanin. This is malvidin 3 glucoside the major uh, anthocyanin that's found in wine. And these are some of the uh, pathways whereby we've identified that anthocyanins fall apart, OK, where they, where they lead on to. I'll start at the top. And we've known this for a long time. Anthocyanins love to interact with tannins. As a, I'm a tannin chemist by, by training, and it is virtually impossible to isolate tannins that are uh, not pigmented from a grape that is into fruit ripening. It's just not possible. Whether that's formed in the grape or whether these things just love to react with each other, you know, that's still open speculation. But there's no question that tannins react with anthocyanins to form products such as this. Now, this is an anthocyanin up on the top. Uh, this is what might be thought of as a tannin molecule. Uh, this has undergone an oxidation step. So in order to go through this process, anthocyanin combining with tannin to form a molecule like this, you need to not only combine the two, but you need to, at that point, go through a subsequent oxidation step. All right? Here's another avenue that anthocyanins can go. Anthocyanins can react with tannins that we've talked about up here, but it can also involve acetaldehyde. So remember the slide before. Acetaldehyde is produced when you oxidize ethanol, as Dr. Waterhouse talked about. Well, these two can form these, this additional linkage. And we call these ethylidine bridges. And so that is a, a quite an abundant uh, structural feature of tannins. And it's, uh, we'll talk about that in a second. Here, acetaldehyde can react directly with the anthocyanin to form this class of a molecule, which is called a vitacin. And then we've got another pathway here where this is a caffeic acid. The most abundant hydroxycinamic acid that's found in a grape is called uh, caftaric acid. Caftaric acid is a caffeic acid that's been esterified with tartaric acid. But you all know that, right? <laughs> so the equivalence of this guy can combine with an anthocyanin and then go through a decarboxylation reaction to form what is called a pinotin, and it's called a pinotin because it was first uh, characterized from a South African variety, pinotage, okay? So here's pinotin. So what is unique about a lot of these things? One of the things that you'll notice about these new products is that they're, they're more extended in terms of their conjugation. And from a chemistry standpoint, what that suggests then is that the equilibrium form lies on the side of red, okay? So not only are we forming new products, but the proportion of the new products that you can actually observe increases as you form these products. And that becomes a critical component of red wine's color stability. All of these products are produced through oxidation. And these are the major products that we've been able to identify that involve anthocyanins, OK? So oxygen is clearly involved in, in color stability. Let's get back to this guy here. This is that acetaldehyde, that ethylidine bridge that is formed uh, when acetaldehyde is produced through ethanol oxidation. And it combines with uh, uh, tannins, glues them together, essentially. And I've got here on this graph here, this is a, some work that uh, was done in Bordeaux, where they tracked the proportion of this type of a linkage versus this type of a linkage. This is the type of linkage that would be formed in the grape. And this is tannin. And then this is something that would happen during red wine aging. And what you can see through these different regions in Bordeaux, as the wine ages, the proportion of this compound relative to this compound, or, or that linkage relative to the other linkage, increases. And what that tells us is that the tannin system, that polymer that lends astringency to us, is increasing proportionally as that wine ages. On the, on the y-axis, what you'll see here, this is the percent of this structure or the, the total linkages that have this feature, you can see that it's not very high. It, it's not very high at all. And what that tells us, what we think is going on, is that the proportion, uh, or that this molecule here is actually not that stable. And it moves on into the formation of other new compounds. All right. So now we're listening to Metallica. Um, Here's the, uh, the sulfur dioxide that Andy was talking about, Dr. Waterhouse. And you can see that it can react with acetaldehyde to form this bisulfite 
uh, acetaldehyde uh, thing. But holy smokes, look at what acetaldehyde can be involved in, all right? There's all sorts of new molecules that acetaldehyde is intimately related to, okay? All right, now let's put some colors to the picture. These are the colors of the products that I've just been talking about, in addition to a lot of others, okay? And we can start with our anthocyanin. You know, it's red. It's, some people would say it's blue-purplish. But then we have a lot of these new products that are formed through aging. And again, oxygen is a very intimate um, component of that aging process. And you can see the colors that come out of that. And you think of the transition from a red wine, from that bluish, purplish, red hue to something that's more brick red in relation. You can see, envision that it might be a combination of red on top of orange with a little yellow added. Can you see how you can easily get that brick red color, all right? And so there are a lot of these new products that are formed through oxidation that are very much thought of as being what we see, a product of what um, that's all about. So some preliminary conclusions. Oxidation is a major component in red wine maturation and aging. Anthocyanin stabilization is critically important and critically linked uh, to oxygen. And tannin structure is certainly modified during that process. And one of the big things that we're th looking at on the tannin side is what is a softening effect that happens during tannin? Not only in the vineyard, because we do think of tannins ripening in the vineyard, but also there's no question when you age a red wine in oak barrels, it softens up. And, and it's trying to understand the chemistry of that and the structural changes that are going on that lead to that. Understanding of structure modification has certainly led to a lot of studies on impact of oxygen and phenolics. And so one of the things that I think has been really critical with Nomacork is their interest in trying to very strategically measure oxygen levels in wine to see how oxygen exposure precisely controlled leads to the formation of new compounds so that we can really start to understand oxygen's role in color stability and uh, mouthfeel. So oxygen supplementation certainly uh, can positively impact color stability and astringency quality. Oxygen can be added pre-malolactic fermentation. It can be added post-malolactic fermentation. And uh, it can certainly happen post-bottling. So, and it can happen whether you age your wine in an oak barrel. It can happen whether you do micro-oxygenation. Um, and then, as uh, Dr. Vidal talked about, nano-oxygenation -oxy uh, through a clo closure system in the bottle. Knowledge of wine determines success and critical that oxygen is managed accordingly. It's understanding the combination of what is your wine composition and how is that composition going to respond to oxygen, okay? That, that's really what it's about. So there's a lot of studies that have been published. Uh, the, the evidence is really ramping up in terms of our ability to understand oxygen role on uh, structure. And I'm just gonna point out one of them. Uh, this was a Nomacork study that was uh, uh, sponsored. Uh, where a, a combination of micro-oxygenation, that's uh, you know, bubbling uh, oxygen through the fermenter, diffusing it, uh, and nano-oxygenation, uh, the, the combination of the two was investigated. Uh, and this is a study that was uh, uh, conducted uh, by Gambuti in Italy, uh, just recently published, just this month. Uh, two wines were prepared, wine one, wine two, differing in pH. Uh, they were subjected to micro-oxygenation uh, two mils per liter per month for a period of eight weeks, and the wine was maintained at 11 and a half degrees Celsius. And then a second uh, microoxygenation treatment, which was a combination of microox one, and then it went through an additional microoxygenation for a longer period of time. All right, so th think about what we're trying to do. Understand how much oxygen is going into the system, and then how does that lead to the formation of specific products? And then once these uh, wines had undergone microoxygenation, then they were bottled up with three different closure systems, uh, low, medium, and high, differing in the amount of oxygen, uh, oxygen transfer rate into the bottle. Okay, so not only are we getting microoxygenation, but we're also getting nanooxygenation. This is a portion, and I don't have time to, to talk about all these studies that are going on, and I just wanted to point this one out because it uh, points out a couple of features that I've talked about. Let's look at the bottom here, total anthocyanin concentration in milligrams per liter for the control in the two different uh, microox treatments 
three months after microoxygenation, and then 42 months after bottling. That's almost uh, uh, four years after, is that four years? Yeah, that's four years, um, af after it was bottled. Look at the concentration of anthocyanins here and here. And this is what really points out just how much anthocyanins become modified during that period of time. There's less than 10% of the original anthocyanins that were grape extracted that are now present in that system. And so how do you stabilize those anthocyanins? How do you convert those anthocyanins, which a portion of them are red, to something that stays red, okay? And that's, the, that's what we're trying to do. It's commonly thought that hue, the amount of yellow that's in that red system, increases in the real thing that red wine makers freak out about a little bit is, I don't want my, you know, brick red's great in an aged wine, but holy smokes, if it's, if it's in a young red wine, then there, there's some problems here. And microoxygenation is the thing that people worry about in terms of, if I overexpose it to oxygen, I'm gonna form too many of the yellow products, too many of the orange products, and my wine's gonna look prematurely aged. And what I'm pointing out here is that it doesn't really change that much. Okay, microoxygenation, and that's a pretty, pretty good microoxygenation, didn't affect the hue of the wine that much. Color intensity, not a huge change in this situation. And this is really interesting because you'll look in the chemical, the published literature and a lot of these controlled experiments, and sometimes you see color stability happen, sometimes you don't, sometimes you get softening of the astringency, sometimes you don't. And so it's really trying to understand the system that you're looking at how do you line up and manage the oxygen in that system to get the effect that you want? So in this one, the, the, the uh, color was fine. This is a new um, analytical method that was developed by this Italian group that very much looks at uh, salivary, it's called the salivary precipitation index. And so it's kind of a, an analytical method that mimics salivary protein and how it interacts with tannin. And this is that index, grams per liter of tannic acid, that's the equivalence of these different closure systems, low, medium, and high, for the two wines, okay? And here is the result of that. And what we see is that the high oxygen transfer rate in wine two was associated with a softening uh, reduction in that perceived astringency. Wine one, you had some effect, but perhaps not completely uh, in terms of what you were looking for. And then this is the actual sensory studies where we can actually get a different result again where analytical might not necessarily relate to perception and sensorially. Um, and so here we see that effect high oxygen transfer rate related to a reduction in stringency in Y1 but that wasn't necessarily associated with that analytical result. And so it's really important to do those uh, sensory experiments for sure. So. I'd like to move on into some of the practical tools that uh, we've seen. A lot of the research that's been done, we, we're getting a really good handle on some of the structures that are formed during oxygen exposure, oxidation, and now we're starting to add on the sensory component uh, to that. So oxygen is an effective tool for managing red wine. We're really, the evidence is uh, really adding up on the research side. It has more to do now with strategically managing specific wines uh, in terms of their oxygen capacity and how oxygen is gonna either benefit or potentially not benefit a specific wine. Um, questions to ask, when you're ox managing oxygen in your winery, do you expect color issues? Is your wine low color? Is it, are you making a rosé? And so on and so forth. Um, do you have color issues historically with your wine? You want to ask these questions. Are there tannin structure issues? Uh, and we all know that you know, young wine, aged wine, but perhaps at the time of bottling, you still have aggressive tannins. Perhaps you've got bitterness in your wine. These are aspects that oxygen can absolutely work with and you can help, that can help you manage those sensory components. How will other chemistry be influenced by the increase in oxygen exposure? <laughs> Dr. Waterhouse talked about sulfur dioxide and, and how sulfur dioxide can ch change and how it can affect the oxidation reactions. So you wanna be thinking about that in terms of your stage of production. And then aroma. And uh, Dr. Giuliano talked about other aroma aspects uh, in oxygen and how its role in, in, in aroma. So it's really the big package that you're really trying to understand. It's the aroma the preservatives that you have in the system, and certainly the phenolic composition, that it, you, it's a critical component to putting it all together. And 
you want to think about uh, when you're exposing your system to oxygen, what is the ultimate impact that it's going to have on the ultimate uh, sulfur dioxide in the packaged system. So wine phenolic response to oxygen. Uh, think about sulfur dioxide and phenolics. What are the concentrations in color, tannin, and hydroxyceramic acids? Now, a lot of you on the winemaking side aren't analyzing your wines routinely, uh, but you're working with blocks routinely, uh, blocks of fruit. And so I think it's trying to understand the history of what that block delivered to the winery in terms of color stability, um, in terms of astringency quality that'll help manage and drive your program. Um, low phenolic wines, uh, and this is kind of, you know this, uh, they are more uh, sensitive to oxygen, so you want to be able to manage that a little more carefully on low phenolic stuff. For deeply pigmented wines, maybe you don't have a color issue, for example, but you want to work on the structure. And that st study that I showed you is an example where we're not seeing a color stability effect. The, the wine didn't have those issues. What we were really looking for microox for was to affect ox oxygenation. So these are some real rough kind of uh, ideas in terms of what you might be thinking about uh, if you've got high tannin concentrations, anthocyanin concentrations, and what you might expect to see as an impact of microoxygenation. So for high tannin, <laughs> high color wines, you're definitely going to form, and this, this TA condensation reactions, another way of looking at that would be these modified anthocyanin structures, or, or you're, you're likely going to accelerate their production. And that's just simply due to their concentrations elevated to begin with, okay? Um, and as a result, and you see this, higher phenolic content wines require more oxygen to get an effect. And you can look at the other end where you've got low tannin, low color, um, it's difficult to produce just because the concentrations are so low to begin with. Um, and then it potentially might not be an optimal candidate with regard to phenolics, uh, you, although you do see some elevation sometimes with color intensity, um, it, you might be thinking about oxygen management more from an aroma uh, standpoint. And then these are some typical um, pre-MLF, post-MLF, and a few slides back, and uh, Malcolm said that you'll have access to these slides and give you an idea of the closure oxygen transfer rate that you can expect during a nano-oxygenation uh, treatment. And I think that's it. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Stefan Vidal. Uh, Dr. Vidal is going to wrap it all up and uh, take you home.